Füllen wir ein, 26, 30. Ja. Okay, 501, I'm still waiting for another minute uh, to let people come in. Okay, so it's 5.02. We reached 100 participants. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, ANS Spine Section webinar uh, tonight. Um, my name is Luan Ringer. I'm going to moderate this, this webinar. Uh, I'm from the University of Mainz in Germany. And as a speaker, we do have Ehab Schieban tonight, who's from the University of Augsburg in Germany as well. Uh, we know just a uh, for a long time, and I have invited him to give this lecture tonight. So the topic we're going to talk about is a topic which um, where, where we had a lot of changes during recent years and a lot of changes in indications. For a decade ago, the indications for fusion in lumbar degenerative diseases were almost agreed on, and there, there were a lot of similarities among the, the different institutions, how one fusions were done and when fusions were indicated and there were the typical markers of instability or for a pain generated from, from the disc. But this changed in recent years and therefore we have this uh, webinar now on indications for lumbar fusion in degenerative spinal disease. And Ehab Shiva is gonna give this, this webinar and I'm happy to have him here. Uh, thanks Ehab for, for doing this and the stage is yours. Please start. Thank ah, you. Perfect. Excuse me. What, 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 some housekeeping. I forgot one important housekeeping remark. Uh, for everybody who has questions, please use the Q&A box and not the chat. The Q&A box is easier to handle. So please type your questions in the Q&A box and then we're going to do this afterwards, discuss the topics uh, and include your questions. Now, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Florian. Um, my name is Ehab Shiba, neurosurgery uh, department in Augsburg, Germany. I would like to say hi to everyone who's uh, online. Just read that people are from Malaysia or Palestine or Saudi Arabia, so hi to everyone. Good night to you in Malaysia, I guess. So these are my disclosures. Uh, a bunch of uh, spine implant, um, you know, in industry partners, but this has nothing to do with the talk itself. So the learning objectives will be to discuss when to do instrumentation or lumbar fusion for stenosis, degenerative spondylolisthesis, or for chronic low back pain. Uh, we'd like to show you a few cases uh, firsthand. This is a, a clear case of instrumentation where you have a high grade spondylolisthesis, in grade one to two with back pain, radiating pain to the legs. I think it's clear for everyone here. So if you want to do surgery, you should do instrumentation in these cases. Uh, the, it's different in cases where you see a, a, an older patient with neurogenic claudication, uh, no other comorbidities. He has a slight stenosis, point four five, slight degenerative changes, three four four five. No real instability on X-rays. So most of us today would say only do decompression. But I will show you the data that even in Europe and especially in the US, these patients are still getting instrumentation surgery, but the data nowadays is telling us different uh, recommendations. These are most of the patients that are still getting instrumentation also in Europe. You have these slight degenerative changes, in grade one, three, four with stenosis, four, five, and so on. You have patients with a, a clinic like a low back pain, radiating pain to the legs, and the question here is, do we really need to do instrumentation surgery also in these patients? You do an X-ray, you see um, no, uh, no apparent instability on flexion extension. You do a CT scan, you see these you know, findings in the disc space. Maybe it's unstable, probably not, you're not sure. And most of us would uh, recommend instrumentation. But again, the data now I will show you doesn't support that anymore. So basically we have these two kind of patients, only stenosis or stenosis and a slight degenerative vistasis, what to do with these patients. So the rationale, I would like to tell you the story, how this came upon that most of these patients are getting instrumented. 
uh, the teaching was that the genitive spondylolisthesis is, is probably considered to be unstable. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, there were no uh, real knowledge about how to really measure instability. Now we have a little bit more knowledge on that and flexion extension CT findings and all that. And some also suggested that if you do decompression surgery on these patients, they will become unstable. And that's why the recommendation would be to do instrumentation in the get-go. 30 years ago, we had two uh, single center studies. Well, nowadays, the, both are not considered high level evidence because both were pretty much observational studies. The first one here was uh, about 50 patients, half had the instrumentation, the other half uh, only decompression, but the patients chose with the surgeon what kind of treatment they uh, wanted. Also, the second one was an observational study not really randomized and both showed that instrumentation yielded better clinical results at a follow-up time. So since then, most of the patients with slight spondylolisthesis also got fusion. 20 years ago, we had a very good randomized controlled trial um, comparing instrumentation or, or to only decompression. And it was clear even then that instrumentation did not yield better results than decompression alone, as you can see here. Excellent, good results in almost 80% uh, of cases in both groups. No real difference between two cases, the two groups. But still, um, that didn't change the way uh, things were done. Patients were still having uh, instrumentation surgery. And this is kind of uh, remarking, remarkable if you look at this data. This is a JAMA article from 2010 looking a very big uh, cohort of patients from Medicare recipients in the US who only had lumbar stenosis. Again, they only had lumbar stenosis. And then they looked at about the differences in treatment modalities. Again, this is the US. You see that stenosis alone, 20% uh, had fusion surgery for these patients. Um, so again, even though they already had data that uh, you shouldn't do instrumentation with these cases, many of them also had uh, stenosis, uh, complex instrumented surgery. And this uh, also, so you see the years before that, um, the number of these fusion surgeries was also increasing. 10 years ago, we had the SPORT trial. This is the thing you all should know about. This was basically three major trials, randomized control trials. One was disc herniation, the other one was stenosis. And the one relevant for this talk was the lumbar degenerative spinal diseases trial. These were randomized controlled trials in the US comparing conservative treatment to surgery. So they had the randomization part of the trial, but they also had observational part of the trial because of the patients that didn't want to be randomized, they were observed, so they didn't lose the data. So these were the inclusion criteria, degenerative changes at L3, 4 or 4, 5, um, had one or two level uh, instrumentation surgery. This was published in the New England Journal 2007, and this was really for a long, long time, the article you were referring to when you would recommend surgery for patients. So they had 300, more than 300 patients randomized and 300 patients observed. Um, they run basically two separate prospective trials. And they had also a very good follow-up data after two years for the randomized trial and for the observational part of the trial also. Um, but before we go into the data, I would like to you know, bore you a little bit about statistics, but this is really important. You need to understand the difference of intention to treat or as protocol um, to understand the data I'm gonna show you. So do, please <laughs> stay online, don't click out. So let's say you have two treatment options, surgical or conservative treatment. And the problem of crossover is a big issue in randomized controlled trials. Let's say one of these patients is unhappy with conservative treatment, otherwise he wouldn't cross over, and he goes to the other uh, treatment arm. What to do with the data? Basically, you can do three things. Either do not analyze, it's called pair protocol. The problem here is that if you do the pair protocol analysis, you will see that conservative treatment is 100% effective and surgical treatment, 75% uh, happy patients. But this is not true because the patient was here unsatisfied with the treatment and went to the other treatment arm. So that's why is pair protocol not very uh, accurate. The thing you read most is intention to treat analysis. 
the th the here you analyze the patient as they were randomized to, even though if this patient was randomized to conservative treatment and went surgery, he will be analyzed as a patient after conservative treatment. This is pretty much the best method to analyze these kind of studies because here you see uh, conservative treatment is 75% effective and surgical arm is 75% effective, which is the most accurate way to look at this data. If the patient crosses over here and he's still unhappy, then you have the analyze as treated or as treated analysis. Here you see that this is good for the surgical treatment. So three from five are um, you know, happy, but this is not an accurate um, analysis of the conservative treatment because here you have three 100% uh, satisfied patients with, which is not true. So the best way to analyze this data where you have randomized trial where patients will cross over is to the intention to treat analysis so that you can have a good analysis of both treatment groups. So here you see the SPOT trial, the problem was that it, uh, the ASTREET analysis, if you're looking at the patients, many of them crossed over from one side to the other, making this one of the big limitations of the study. So if you look at the intention to treat is uh, 159 versus 145, but many cross over. So the ASTREET analysis was much different. Many of the patients that were randomized for conservative treatment went to surgical treatment. And here you see the big differences. The black lines are the as treated and the white lines as intention to treat. So basically the randomized part of the study was negative. There were no differences between both groups. If you look at the data here, the white lines, the black lines showed a big benefit for surgery. But again, here you have a little bit of the as treated analysis, which is not very accurate as I just showed you. So basically the better analysis, the intention to treat analysis, came out negative. Uh, this, this was, uh, you know, um, SF36 pain scale, SF36 physical component scale, and ODI, all of which had the same analysis. The white lines were not different between both groups, and the black lines, the ASTREET analysis showed benefit for surgery. So that was the problem of um, the selection bias with the patients that were only observed, that the second part of the uh, SPORT trial, here, the patient chose their treatment. And obviously, if you choose this treatment, you are more happy with that. You chose surgery, so you are better off with surgery, basically. But here, the observational part of the SPOT trial showed that surgery was much better for both all the same you know, outcome parameters. So the limitation, again, for the randomized control trial, uh, many of them went across over. So the, the results were... Um, you know, discussed very much in our you know, yearly meetings, but still this was to that time the best uh, data we had. So the consequence was that we now know that surgery was better than conservative treatment, but we still didn't know if fusion was necessary. So now in 2016 and most recently 2021, we have now randomized controlled trials looking exactly at these patients with or without instrumentation. I will show you the data for that now. The first one was the SLIP study, spinal amnectomy versus instrumented pedicle screw fusion. This was a US study published in the same journal as the other study I'm going to show you now. This is a five center randomized controlled trial. They only enrolled 66 patients. One of the major limitations was that most of the patients were from a single trial. This was mostly very famous spine surgeons, but again, a randomized controlled trial. 35 assi assigned to fusion, uh, only to decompression, sorry, and 31 patients were for lamnectomy and fusion. Uh, so 6 is randomized at four-year follow-up, 26 were still available after the decompression alone, and 19 decompression and fusion. The inclusion criteria were, you know, the miding a grade one spondylolisthesis with consecutive stenosis, but they excluded uh, apparent instability. So here you're seeing no real difference between both groups, decompression alone and fusion group, no significant uh, difference statistically, either SF36 also not a real significant difference in the data itself, but there was a difference in uh, the rate of reoperation. The patients who already or only had decompression alone had a higher rate of revision surgery up to 34% compared with fusion group alone. So they concluded that laminectomy plus fusion was 
uh, associated with a slightly greater but clinically meaningful improvement uh, at follow-up. The limitation was that almost 80% of these cases were from one site. So it's not it's hardly a randomized controlled, multi-center randomized controlled trial. And um, one of the arguments was that they had a high dropout rates. I don't think so for a four-year follow-up, 74% and 61 is really not that bad. So this is not a real limitation as you read in month, month, uh, some of these editorials. Um, the problem is that there was no real statistical difference between both groups. So I don't, you know, uh, um, I'm, I don't believe this observation that uh, this was a, a slight but meaningful clinical difference. They also say that uh, if you look at the baseline characteristics of the patients before surgery, there was the patients were better off in the fusion group from the get-go. So they had a better clinical outcome uh, in, in average before surgery. And they write that also in the text itself. It's a marginal, non-significant difference uh, in the baseline variables. Some of the difference in the observed outcome might be attributed to the baseline differences ra rather than to the randomized treatment. So they also, uh, although they concluded that fusion is better, they also say in the, in the journal itself that it is, it's not really absolutely sure that it's because of the instrumentation itself. Uh, obviously, patients that only, only had decompression came back with back pain, you would suggest fusion, fusion them. If patients already had fusion, there's no real further options. You don't see any you know, adjacent disc disease or what have you. So these differences are also uh, um, explained by you know, common sense uh, indications for follow-up surgery if the patient comes back with back pain. The other uh, New England Journal study, the better one from Switzerland, randomized control trial, seven Swedish centers, 250 patients randomized almost. Here they randomized for fusion and decompression or decompression alone. And then with a, um, a group analysis, they divided that into patients with degenerative spinal diseases uh, or without uh, spinal diseases, also for uh, stenosis alone. So again, randomization was very uh, good in this um, study, fusion or decompression. They had uh, 111 per protocol analysis and 117 in the decompression group alone. But here, to make a long story short, there were no differences between groups in patients with uh, out the general spinal, uh, only spinal canal stenosis, no difference with or without uh, instrumentation. And patients with degenerative spinal disc disease also here, no clinical difference between both groups. So no real benefit for instrumentation surgery, even in these patients. So they concluded that in patients with lumbar stenosis with or without degenerative spinal disease, you don't need to do instrumentation surgery. Limitations here was the degree of spinal disease was not really uh, well documented. Uh, they didn't do flexion extension x-rays to rule out apparent instability and the type of decompression varied. So people were either doing one-sided decompression, hemilaminectomy or laminectomy. Um, and we still don't know what was the threshold for reoperation. It wasn't really created, uh, stated in the paper, but again, the key home message was from the, this paper also that you don't need instrumentation for that. Now, 2016, we had a Cochrane uh, systematic review looking at all the data to that time, the surgical options for lumbar stenosis. And here again, if you compare decompression alone versus instrumentation, there's no added benefit for lumbar instrumentation in these patients also. The last data we have now is from the New England Journal from last year. Also a very well conducted randomized control trial, 16 surgical departments, stenosis and listasis, and even 20% of these patients had a slippage of more than three millimeters even. So th these patients were randomized to fusion and decompression or decompression alone, again, like the other studies before. Um, at follow-up, they had 106 patients per protocol uh, analysis after um, decompression only, and 110 fusion and decompression. And here again, this was a non-inferiority study trial again, but also there's no difference or no added benefit for instrumentation uh, regardless of how you analyze that. So here once more, 
no real benefit for instrumentation. The clinical evaluation also didn't show any differences, as you can see here, between decompression alone and decompression and instrumentation, no difference. The reoperation rate was slightly higher in the decompression alone group, 5% versus 9%, but this was not statistically significant. So here they concluded that in a two-year follow-up, there was no need for uh, no added benefit of instrumentation, even in patients with uh, um, spondylolisthesis of more than three millimeters. So the conclusion was you have the SPORT trial. It was profusion uh, back then. The RCT was basically negative, but the observational arm was positive. The SLIP trial from the US it was profusion, but again, I showed you that there was no real data supporting that, even in the study itself with many limitations. The Swedish study was contrafusion because there were no clinical added benefit for instrumentation. The concurrent review, looking at all the data until then, was also contrafusion, and the latest data from the Nordstrom study was also, was also contrafusion. So in conclusion, for the degenerative spondylolisthesis patients with stenosis, with or without spondylolisthesis, without apparent instability, you should only do decompression. So a few more slides about chronic low back pain. Uh, patients, these are slightly different patients uh, than the one I showed you until now. So low back pain is one of the um, more, uh, highest uh, uh, illnesses in the world with uh, causing living or years living with disability. There was a worldwide analysis from the Bill Gates Foundation. You see this map here looking at all the countries, all the diseases and the top 10 um, clinical illnesses. You see here that low back pain is the the number one cause of living with disability worldwide. This is mostly in all of the countries without exception of Sub-Saharan Africa. This year is the third one is AIDS and in China. Otherwise, all over the world, low back pain was uh, disease number one for living with um, disability. So it's a very common disease and you will see many of these patients. These are patients that you do an MRI, you see slight de degenerative changes, but you don't see instability or listesis. So not sure what to do with these patients. For many years, um, up to date also, in the US, these patients are getting instrumentation surgery. Here, one would argue 5S1 has degenerative changes, so you might do some kind of instrumentation or worse, uh, a prosthesis. But nowadays, in, in Europe at least, we do not do any kind of surgery for these patients, and I'll show you why. Here, the, again, these patients have no apparent instability. You should always rule that out. The data on chronic low back patients started also uh, 30 years ago. There were also randomized controlled trials randomizing these patients for surgery or conservative treatment. The first studies showed, uh, unfortunately, that surgical treatment had a better clinical outcome with a two-year follow-up. This was one of the first studies for these chronic low back pain patients. But if you look at the data more carefully, you see that in these patients, much better or better in half of the 50% of cases, unchanged in 25% of cases in the surgical group. Um, so yes, looking at the overall data, 30% versus 14%, here 33% versus 14%, surgery, surgery is better. But here you're comparing you know, physiotherapy with um, in maximal invasive surgery and uh, almost half of the patients are either unchanged or worse. So probably leave these patients with conservative treatment as unchanged or worse rather than then, uh, perform surgery on these patients. Uh, after a few years after that, a second randomized controlled trial from Norway, a very well-conducted trial compared uh, instrumentation for conservative treatment in these patients. And here you see after one year, no, um, difference between fusion or exercise, basically. So in 2015, uh, 13, sorry, uh, the Spine Journal, which is you know, the uh, official journal of the North American Society of Spine, the, the US guys, they published that uh, comparison of all studies for then for, for chronic low back pain, long-term long follow-up showed that three randomized controlled trials were negative. This is the data after 12 years. You see over time, there's no difference between fusion or conservative treatment in these patients. So now we know we shouldn't do any kind of surgery on these patients. Either you look at the intention to treat analysis and the as treated analysis also no statistical difference between both groups. 
So uh, what to do with these patients? I will just, this is an off-label use, so I'm not gonna go into details. These are patients that are coming back again and again, have low back pain and have real pain. So what to do if you can't do anything? Uh, this was one of the earliest papers using neural modulations for back pain. This is Alkaze, is a, a pain specialist from London. He did a, a prospective single center trial for these patients. This is very low level. So again, only off-label use to, uh, till today. Uh, he showed that in these patients where nothing else helps, if you do uh, spinal cord stimulation, they will get better and follow up of uh, 36 months with you know, marked relief in pain. But again, this is off-label use. Now there are a few multicenter randomized trials from industry sponsored using neural modulation that will come out the next year, showing us probably that um, it's better than conservative treatment, but we need to be careful. Again, low back pain has many, many different reasons, so don't opt always for some kind of surgical treatment. So in conclusion, Indication for fusion now specifically in patients with a lumbar stenosis without apparent instability, only do decompression. There is no data supporting that you need to do instrumentation in these patients. And for chronic low back pain for now, don't do surgery. Okay, that's it. So thank you very much. I'll just stop sharing now. Roya? Yes, I'm back again. Thank you, Ea, for this uh, comprehensive presentation and for uh, this, this very good overview on, on the recent evidence we have for uh, fusion surgery, whether it's for low back pain or is for uh, the de degenerative spondylolisthesis. And that there's a lot of discussion now after the, the publications on degenerative spondylolisthesis. So you said no fusion for degenerative spondylolisthesis. Right. But the, the, the questions coming up, well, which are the subgroups where you would consider fusion? Or let's say that the first important point, does it make a difference whether this is a dynamic spondylolisthesis or it's non-dynamic, which means uh, three millimeters difference in, in flexure extension? Well, would this make a difference? And how was it uh, evaluated within the studies? Well, within the studies, most of them didn't really, the American study ruled out these patients, so I don't know. The other studies from uh, Scandinavia didn't really look at that as a parameter. So they didn't rule out apparent instability. What we do in Augsburg is we always do flexion and extension. So if they have instability or you know movement of more than three millimeters, I would still recommend for some kind of instrumentation. Nowadays, uh, a semi-rigid instrumentation. I don't do you know inter lift or T lift in these cases. I try to make it as small as possible. Um, so my recommendation would be if you have a myelin grade one, let's just make a flexion extension x-ray and see if they are moving. And if so, probably you need some kind of instrumentation depending on local preference. If you don't see any movement, just do decompression and tell the patient that he might come back in a few years and then you have to do fusion if it's symptomatic. Okay, you, you mean you would still, those which are mobile, you would still still fuse those? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, well, are, you, are you looking for any something like facet joint orientation or, or disc height or, because the, the, there is, we, we certainly see now that the majority when looking at a study population of patients with a degenerative sp spondylolisthesis do not need fusion, but we're still wondering which are the subgroups which potentially do need fusion, which are the ones which go come back for uh, index segment instability in for a secondary fusion. There's certainly a, a small amount of those patients which do not show up within those studies with a bigger cohort. My problem uh, is like- Do you use any, any of those parameters? Like, I mean, there, there has been suggested faster joint orientation with a sagittal or, or coronal uh, discate patient BMI and patient age. Well, basically, I know what I don't, um, what we don't use. It's we don't use diagnostic facet joint infiltration anymore. In a patient with, you know, primarily back pain, so the radicular leg pain and movement on x-ray, that's enough for me to indicate for instrumentation. Otherwise, it, 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 it doesn't matter what kind of data you look in the literature, you'll see, you know, uh, pros for this or contra for that. So it's still not clear how to choose these patients. So basically, if 
they, I try to keep it simple. So if they move on flexion and extension, I would be for fusion, to be honest. Otherwise, there's no real criteria to identify these patients that will probably benefit from fusion. It's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still it's still a bit unclear because in, in the in, in the most recent one, I think I remember there was about 20% of mobile slips. Uh, yeah. but yeah. there there's no there's no it's, there's no subgroup analysis as it was not statistically powered to look at this group, and therefore they don't know whether this group might be the one which does need fusion. But when looking at the whole cohort, there's no difference. No. Unfortunately, oh, yeah. we don't have the data on the you know reoperation patients. Yeah. Maybe these were the patients that had, you know, slippage or not. I'm not sure. It's not, you know, it's not uh, online either. Okay. Now there, there are several questions in the Q and A, and the, the first one which came in, which uh, we, we can discuss, on was on, uh, on the decompression, whether it was really laminectomy in slip or laminotomy. And th this is the question I, I would add on and, and say, that, does it make a difference from, from the, the clinical, from the functional outcome, from the stenosis symptoms of the patient, whether you do a laminectomy or do you do a less invasive laminotomy? Uh, and well, what's the difference in, in uh, stability? For clinical outcome, I don't think it makes a difference, but I think it does make a difference if you need re or, or they become, if they become unstable afterwards. There was a very good study from uh, Claudius to me now a few years back, looking at single or bilateral decompression or unilateral or bilateral decompression with undercutting and also um, uh, no difference. So we know that if you do it from one side and do the undercutting, it's as good as bilateral decompression. Uh, but I think if you do a laminectomy, the chance of having uh, revision surgery a few years back is maybe a little bit higher. So then uh, there's a question we already touched upon the point of facet orientation. There's a question about the facet signal as indication for surgery. Uh, that, do you look at facet signal? Does it, is a facet joint effusion a clear indication of instability where you need fusion or uh, something where you walk in low back pain? Does it make a difference whether there's a facet signal or not? Or how, what, what will this mean for you? This we, we, uh, yes, the answer is yes. I would if you if I see a change in the patient has primarily low back, low back pain, and he tells me he had repetitive infiltration, he was better for a year or month. Uh, then I would consider doing a same rigid instrumentation in these patients. But if they have only you know there's no uh, this is not a real you know as according to the data no real indication for surgery. But for me personally, if I see big facets that are, you know, full of liquids, then I would probably uh, be more careful not to do instrumentation. Okay. Yeah. Another question from the Q&A. Do, do you consider a high BMI uh, above 35 something that needs to be addressed before surgery, uh, whether to fuse or not to fuse? And maybe would you... This is something I had recommend to a patient. Right. Uh, you have a BMI above 35, you would not go for surgery. You would recommend having uh, some, some weight loss before you take this patient to surgery. Exactly. In patients with uh, more, you know, highly comorbid BMI or rheumatoid arthritis or have cortisol treatment, whatever, I would just try not to do surgery at all. And if so, just do decompression. Even, even if in higher grade listasis, even in those patients, I, we had a few patients now that are really sick. We just do one-sided decompression and undercutting and wait and see what happens, yeah. Okay, then there's the question whether the studies were run through a company or industry or whether this was excluded uh, because this industry-driven study is much prone to bias and this is this easily answered. Those are investigator initiated studies and there's the, the, those in degenerative spolycesis as well as the right. low back pain. So there's, there's no bias from this side. No, uh, no. at least. Now then there's the question, what, what a vacuum phenomenon in the, in the disc would mean? Is this some, something 
mm-hmm. which could guide an indication for surgery, whether it's a low back pain patient, you would ask yourself, is this somebody for fusion or not? Is this a candidate for surgery or would this make a difference in the, the, the digestive spondylolisthesis patients? I don't think so, to be honest, because we also th- see these changes, you know, in asymptomatic patients. You know, a trauma case comes in, you do a CT, see changes, but he had never had back pain. So I don't think it's a real indication to do anything. Okay. And how many, how many levels were decompressed in the studies in the SLIP, to, uh, the North Stand trial? And, and, up to uh, two levels. Up to two levels, not more. Okay. For amenal stenosis, indirect decomp- uh, first question, for amenal stenosis, is it different? Were for amenal stenosis included or, I mean, that they were not included in the North Stand study? They were excluded because it's a different story where you need to get hate again. Right. And there's the question, indirect decompression by olive, x lift or direct uh, T-lift, pl- plif, uh, how, how would you treat the foramenal stenosis? Well, with posterior decompression, uh, we'll try not to use instrumentation if you don't have to. It doesn't so matter. Yeah. If you have bony foramenal stenosis, you would try to go for a decompression of the person. What, what would you do? Re- remove the facet joint, unilateral facet joint, or just drill in the foramen? And, uh, if it's, mostly it's one-sided, so just do decompression, and sometimes even to a wide decompression. If it's only one side, I would not go for prophylactic instrumentation. If it's bilateral, then I would do uh, fusion surgery or semi-rigid instrumentation to remove everything from posterior. Okay. But, yeah. but I don't think you'll get into trouble if you remove one facet joint from one side, even lumbar. You remove the, the whole, if you remove the whole joint? Yeah, from okay. one side. Yeah, I don't think you get into trouble. Okay. Uh, these are cases where, where, where I r- rather tend to go for a fusion if I, if I have to remove the whole facet joint because I'm worried about uh, a secondary thing and then get additional hate by, by, by cage in and, and uh, keep this hate by, by the post instrumentation. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, what is it? Do, do you do any instrumentation if you do more than three level laminectomies? Oh, oh, well, what's the indication for le- three-level laminectomy? That's the question, actually. Now, lumbar stenosis, let's say. Well, what do you do it like? Like you do more than the cervical cases. You do certain. Yes. A lot, a lot of people tend, they do three cervical ACDF, they add a plate. Right. Uh, well, would you do any, anything similar in the lumbar spine where I think you do uh, several laminectomies? It gets unstable because you, you lose the posterior tension band and. Well, I don't, for me. Yeah, yeah, I don't do laminectomy, so it's, I do interlaminar fenestration, even three level. It takes a little bit longer, but you know, then no, no need for instrumentations. But in patients where you need wide decompression and laminectomies, these are the cases where you do instrumentation. Okay. What about scoliosis and degenerative stenosis? This is a very, a very, a very open question for yes. For <laughs> These are patients that were not included in these uh, studies. So, after a few years of doing degenerative scoliosis, I know that if I'm, I don't have to, I don't want to do them because com- the complication rate can go up to fifty percent in the five to seven years post-op for up time. And this is not only data from Augsburg. This is you know data from the deformity groups and all the studies we have. So nowadays I do decompression only if, if it's not really you know, a horrible scoliosis. And then patients come back after a half a year or a year and they get spinal cord stimulation. That's the way I'm kind of trying to change that. For lumbar scoliosis patients? Degenerative scoliosis. With uh, low back pain. Right, so I do decompression, see what happens if they are better off, but you know, still have a lot of pain, low back pain, then I would rather do um, spinal cord stimulation. First of all, they already had decompression from me, so it's a failed back surgery syndrome per protocol, mm-hmm. and you are allowed to do spinal cord stimulation. But I don't do, I try not to do at least, these T4 to S2 instrumentation and decompression in an 80-year-old degenerative scoliosis. I just don't believe but, it. But that, that's a difference with what you mentioned, 80-year-old. 
Yeah. I think for for degenerative scoliosis, degenerative lumbar scoliosis, uh, the the of course, like in every other surgery, the patient selection is paramount. It's the, the most important point. And um, you mentioned that the, the high number of complications and the high number of reoperations. Um, but we do we do know all this that, that there's a forty percent complication rate, twenty five percent reoperation rate within uh, one or two years. But on the other hand, if you have a good patient selection on those patients, you have after these two years and even after five years, um, a very high number of patient satisfaction. The one that oh, survived. Uh, huh? The no. ones that survived, yes. Uh, it, that, and that's, um, that's certainly not the 80 year, 80 year old. Right. Right. And it's not, it's not the patient you, you, you select because he's complaining of some back pain while playing tennis. Uh, this is the patient who's really suffering from low back pain from his lumbar scoliosis uh, in a reasonable age group, which have a have a rocky road to getting good, but which do get quite good. And uh, for those, it's worthwhile doing doing those those even long fusions. I, I try to stay short, and of course, we all know those those pictures from T4 to ilium, and which is the uh, I think should should be very very uh, selected case where we do this this large ones, but but a regular do for selected scoliosis patients like three four five segments uh, lumbar fusions and and they do if you select them well have a good outcome or can have a good outcome. Right. Therefore, of course, there's a role for if you have an 80, 80 year old who can't stand surgery. Yes, you have to find some other way decompression plus some stimulation maybe. Uh, but is, is it proven that it really works for those, those scoliosis patients? No, uh, Peter Vaikotsi had a publication a few yeah. years back, which was positive. Uh, but uh, it's not, you know, high level evidence. We still don't know. But it's, a, it's an alternative to do something with a patient that you otherwise wouldn't treat. So decompression and then spinal cord stimulation after a while seems reasonable. We have only a few cases here in Augsburg. But we still need more time and more patience. Yeah. Now, if, uh, what if a patient was not unstable before surgery? What is the probability that he or she may become unstable post op? Are there any pre op indicators? Um, I think those are the things we, we discussed, as right. which are need to get analyzed in more depth, like facet joint orientation, discate, weight, age. Right. Number of levels, which are which are still unclear, and you you find some. The, the problem is that the coming many publications looking for predictors of secondary surgery for instability. Uh, that they everybody tends to look at a different set of of parameters. The ones do look at the sagittal balance. The other one said paraspinal muscles, and the, the next one on the facet joints, and so on. And, and they always, always have a good combination, but not the, the full image of the patient. And um, I think that there's some, some AI, AI, AI studies going on, uh, trying to extract the whole patient information to, to find those predictors of a secondary instabilities. So there's nothing which is, which is completely true. Really, well, my problem is that this will also become more apparent in the next months or years. The problem with AI now is that it's mostly mostly driven from industry. And I would be really careful for a software or a computer from, let's say, a company that tells me with their AI methods, you need to do from T10 to S2 because they want to sell screws. So I'm not you know, saying these are like evil people and trying to sell the implants, but it's hard enough for us now to decide how many levels to do in some cases. And if the company has a new software that is telling us what to do, I'll be more careful. Okay, well, what is the indication of monosegmental fusion after disc surgery with post-operative failed back surgery syndrome uh, without radiation, without spondylolisthesis, persistent post op low back pain? Uh, what is the option? So what, what failed back surgery syndrome after disc surgery, when is there a role for fusion? When would you go for fusion? Um, what, is, what about recurrent discs? Right, recurrent disc, you should, you know, uh, failed back surgery, it's a definition problem. 
Uh, for me, failed back surgery syndrome is if a patient coming back in after previous decompression where you see no instability and you see no restenosis, no real herniated disc. So if you see something, you need to fix it or a, a re-herniated disc, just do surgery again. For low back pain after decompression, we are conducting a multicenter trial from Augsburg, uh, randomizing patients for spinal cord stimulation or fusion. The protocol is done and we're gonna write a few people uh, to join us. So until the data from this randomized trial is finished, it's gonna take us three years. So then I can answer that. For now, I don't know, because if you look at the data for failed back or not failed back surgery for previously decompressed patients, there are hardly any data out there. There are a few, two studies, one comparing conservative treatment to fusion without any difference, and the other one with slight benefit of uh, instrumentation. So I'm, I, I don't know. We'll see, we need to do this randomized trial and then we'll know. Okay. For chronic low back pain, any experience in endoscopic denervation of facet joints? Well, this is a kind of, yes. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I don't know why, but patient, we had like here 18 patients, they are happy. You did something, they have less back pain. I'm not sure it's better than, um, you know, facet joint infiltration, but they have like uh, anesthesia, they are well off for many, many months. Maybe because you are able to, innervate more area than you could do with a facet joint infiltration. But it's not, you know, we did a few and patients are happy, but I don't have real data on that. No, but what, what's, what's, what's the different achievement you get when comparing this to just, just a closed denervation, percutaneous denervation? I think you are able to make more area the thing is um, monopolar of the endoscope. It's much bigger than, you know, uh, a needle you use normally for uh, radiofrequency. Yeah. Or, yeah so maybe it's, that's different, but it's still, uh, you know, real surgery in general anesthesia. Uh, I don't have a real answer for that. We had the system here when I came here and a few patients came back and wanted this again because they were pain-free for a year or a year and a half. So we did it again, but I don't have any real data on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it's, it's a quite, quite controversial whether this makes a difference or not and what, what kind of a difference. And yeah. I, I'm not sure, but you know, the patients wanted uh, they said that they had uh, radio frequency a few times percutaneously, and when they got this endoscopic one, they were very happy for more than a year. Okay. Well, which which type of patient? How do you how do you uh, get the indication for doing an endoscopic uh, facet innervation? You what, what do you ask for? Do you ask for two times positive response to a a local anesthetic plus uh, steroid infiltration or uh, Again, I don't, I don't like this procedure because I don't really believe in it. Uh, so I don't do primarily indicate this for the first time. All the patients I did were patients that already had this for my time and came back for it to, be, to get it again. So I'm okay. not an expert on the data and I wouldn't recommend it as a primary okay. treatment. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question. If you do indeed need instrumentation, do you perform a posterolateral fusion uh, or interbody instrumentation or both? And why? Again, sorry, the question again, because I read now. Posterolateral poster fusion or interbody uh, fusion? Uh, well, or depending both. on the, for the genetic, uh, depending on the degree of instability, if you have, uh, normally we do a pliff. If you need to do decompression, the easiest way to do a, pl a pliff cage is on from both sides. If you need more uh, area, then you do have to do a lateral approach. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry about, I was reading the last comment. Vicozzi is a vascular neurosurgeon and not vertebral column surgery. Vicozzi is the president of the German Association of Spine Surgery. So he, he's a really good spine surgeon as well. Okay, uh, what do you mean by semi-rigid? Um, what is it? 
It's you know the so-called dynamic instrumentation. These are a few companies that either have a peak rod or the screw itself is uh, semi-rigid, which allows a movement in only one axis. So it, some would say, say it's a slow fusion device. It's a, a semi-rigid instrumentation. We, use, we have a German company that has a good screw, but there are also different uh, ideas you know, um, of semi-rigid instrumentation. Okay. Um, what about progressive back pain osteochondrosis patients? A difficult question. Difficult definition, yes. Well, what is, I mean, th th those are the cases where we, we know the majority of low back pain patients uh, do not, are not better, uh, whether you go for fusion or you go for, for conservative therapy. Right. But again, we, we, we all have the feeling there's, there's a, a subgroup of patients which do benefit quite well from fusion, mm -hmm. but it's still not um, completely identify what, what this subgroup of patients is and how we should select those patients and what the predictors for, for a good outcome are. Uh, th this is at least my interpretation at the moment. And I think uh, this, this is what the question touches. What, what is osteo lumbar osteochondrosis or the degenerated disc? Uh, who's a candidate for surgery? It's, it's still not really clear. Same here. Okay, um, so what, what else do we, now I think we, we almost answered all questions and there's, there's one more about adjacent segment disease rates and fusion patients. Maybe you could comment on this. Adjacent disc disease? Adjacent segment, adjacent disc, yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, if, you, if they are symptomatic and they have a claudication or back pain and you have a clear sign of adjacent disc disease, then you should go for surgery. Okay. Right. Now we have one on sagittal balance for patients presenting with low back pain and no significant abnormality on MRI. Is it worth performing a whole spine X-ray to assess sagittal balance? Does correction of sagittal balance, improvement of lumbar lordosis, et cetera, help these patients? No. <laughs> I just say no to, you know, help a few patients avoid surgery. Because even with patients that you have clear um, compensatory mechanisms and changes in the lumbar spine and have clear SV of more than six centimeters, we still don't know if there is still no randomized controlled trial looking if you need to treat sexual balance or not. We know that sexual balance correlates with, or you know, if you, you still have unbalanced patients, they, this will correlate with mechanical failure after all, after a few years. Uh, screw breakage or rod breakage, but it doesn't correlate with clinical outcome. So only for, you know, if you have low back pain and sagittal imbalance, I don't think you should be thinking of surgery if you don't have any stenosis or listesis. Okay. Let me, let me just check what we have. Osteoporosis effector against or for an instrumentation. Try not to do instrumentation. That's you know the easy answer. If you do instrumentation, what what if you need to do an instrumentation in osteoporotic patient, what, what do you do to to avoid or to reduce the number of screw loosenings, implant failures? I, I in these cases I use a semi-rigid device, a dynamic instrumentation. In osteoporosis patients? Yes, cosmic is the, in the main indication. Or if you have to do it rigid, you use you use uh, cement. Then a, a cement augmentation or right. Yeah. But I try to only the upper most level and the lowest more level, not every screw. Okay, okay. You said, I, mean, I think well, one of the, the important points is as well you use the maximum length of screws, maximum diameter of screws to make this stable. And this is even even using big implants. Um, is uh, more effective than 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 uh, doing the augmented screws, uh, and I would be rather uh, not reluctant, but but be careful with the, the, those augmentations, as you can do harm with this as well as the, the study could show that there's a lot of 
uh, cement leakage uh, with significant problems. So I've been getting a bit um, careful with, with doing the, the augmentations in, in those osteoporotic patients, try to get maximum length, maximum diameters of screws in. Uh, there's still questions coming in. Uh, let's see what well, there, what well, we have. Uh, indications from T10 to pelvis fusion in degenerative cases. Uh, I mean, this is what we touched this. They, these are usually the uh, scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis okay. patients where this is an indication if you have a lumbar degenerative scoliosis, then T10 to pelvis uh, it can be an indication. Uh, chronic low back pain, no neurological deficit. MRI showing L3-4 disc prolapse, conservative or operative? Modality. Conservative. Conservative. This is just back pain. Right. I think this this goes more towards the side of conservative. This is the, the low back pain degenerative disc problem. Yeah. Um, there's another one. In... Okay. What do you think about lumbar epidural injections for low back pain? I not much. I, I don't do that, and I don't think it's like. A, uh, well, if you if you have good success with that, okay. But uh, I don't think it's a you know um, a treatment modality for a long term result. You just see the complications of those. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, there are only some some minor questions left. We we can we can answer. Uh, offline uh, and I think we, we we had a very nice discussion where we uh, almost have done this this one hour we were limited to and uh, yeah thanks again for for this nice uh, comprehensive presentation and the, the discussion the extensive discussion thanks for all your comments uh, thanks for everybody who joined us thanks for participating we had almost or I think we had at one time point we had 200 participants which is quite good thanks for joining us thanks for being here and have a nice evening everybody and see you again in one month for the next spine section webinar thanks a lot bye 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 bye